Anybody want to praise God this morning? Anybody besides me? Okay. With us today, okay, we've had them separately, but we have Mike and Mike here, okay? And we have Mike uh, Bartholik, who we already said hello to when he came in for church the first time after surgery. But we have Mike Hardy here, who's smiling and is in less pain and doing, as he said, doing great. Can we give God a great amen? Okay, because listen, that is a huge praise, okay? And it just blesses me. I didn't have any idea where they're going to be sitting in. They're right there together. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to try not to get emotional today, okay? Um, but God has been dealing with me on a, uh, a deep level, okay? And um, it is, if anybody, uh, it, it's, been, it's been a journey, okay? Anybody on a, on a journey with God besides me? Okay? And sometimes, uh, anybody ever here get feeling sorry for yourself besides me? You guys are all holy. Man, perfect. I praise God I get to be your pastor, okay? It makes it so much easier. Okay? And the last little bit, uh, in chapters 1 and 2 here in 1 John, uh, John is, is, is instructing us how to be in the light, how to experience the light of God. And as we begin chapter 3, uh, John calls us to experience the love of God. We'll see that love is pure, it's practical, and love that is perfect. And you say, what journey have you been on that this means so much? Well, I came to this verse in John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, excuse me. And I was going to kind of give it a quick glance over, get her done, and move on because there's some exciting things that are here. And the Holy Spirit said, whoa, time out. I'm out. John writes, he says, see what great love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And we are. And we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it doesn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. Those two verses have filled my every thought for the last week and a half. Because let me ask, okay, I, I know today I'm preaching to a crowd that is most of you uh, have Grew up in church, been part of church. Shoot, Bill has been uh, a Christian longer than I've been alive. Okay, he's that old. Okay, it was easy, you know, at Gateway because Dick Cuttinga is like 77, 78. Okay. But let me ask, when was the last time you contemplated what great love the Father has given us? that we should be called the children of God. Too often we read right over the top of it. Because, we go, oh yeah, God loves me. I know that. I know that God loves me, but listen to it. John is encouraging us to perceive, to understand, not just merely see the outer part of it, when he says, what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And then in the Greek, you know, we have an exclamation point. But in the Greek, there's more than an exclamation point that's there. It is as if it is done, it's over with, it's complete, it's finished. And we are. We are God's children. I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning and looked in the mirror and went, oh my goodness. I saw a sinful creature staring back at me. Anybody else? I saw myself. I know myself. But yet, what great love he has given us. 
We know when we read John 3.16, for God so what? Loved. Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I had both my sons up here. I have a daughter. You know, there's at times I would have freely and willingly, you know, killed all three of them without regret. Anybody else besides me with your kids? It could have been easy done. But give them up for you? Heck no. Yet God gave up his only begotten son for me. Holy and righteous and pure. For me. Paul writing to the church in Rome says in Romans 5, 8, but God proved his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died. What great love the Father has shown us. That while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And I know I'm a, I'm a much worse sinner than you are. But his love was poured out on Calvary's cross, not because I was holy and righteous and good and somehow worthy. It was poured out for me and poured out for you based upon the fact that we were simply sinners in whom he loved. He loved us. Paul writing to Titus says, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. By his mercy. By his love. He didn't hold back anything. He generously poured out his Holy Spirit upon us. Paul again writing the church of Ephesus says, For this reason, and I love the way it is written in the Christian, Christian Standard Bible. It says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father. I kneel before the Father. For whom every family in heaven on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory. To be strengthened with his power in your inner being through his spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love. May be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the length, the width, and the height, and the depth of God's love. And, no, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Seriously, when was the last time you tried to understand God's love. As Paul puts it here, the length and the width, the height and the depth of God's love. How he could love somebody like you. Paul says in Romans that there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. Not on heaven or in earth. I don't know about you, but that just overwhelms my heart. To think about his love. That we're loved by him. And that we're called his children. We're not nieces and nephews. We're children of God. John tells us in John chapter... 1 verse 12, he says, as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name. That we would be called the children of God. And he picks up the same thing, theme here. When he's, Paul develops it um, even more in, as he, we look at the, the doctrine of adoption. That we would be adopted 
In Romans and in Ephesians, he, he goes into great detail, but I think it's summed up very well to the letter to the Galatians where Paul writes this. He says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Therefore, you are no longer slaves, but sons. And if sons, then heirs through God. Just contemplate that. We are adopted into the kingdom of God as sons and daughters. Just at the right time, Jesus came and purchased us with his blood. Those of us who are under law and unable to fulfill the law. The one who kept it perfectly. Shed his blood on Calvary's cross to give us life. And to bring us into the kingdom of God. Not as, as I said as king, as, as cousins or, or even servants. But as sons and daughters of the true and living God. We are adopted. In our modern day, we lose the, 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 the depth of the word adoption. Because we always put it in the context of adopting small children. But it wasn't that way in the Greek world. The word, and listen, I should have asked Bill to at least to have his microphone ready to go so he could say the Greek word for us, okay? English is hard for me. Can I get an amen? Okay? Okay, but I am smart enough to read and understand. It's a compound word. It's a compound word. The first part of that word means son. It means son. And the second part, theus, okay, I can say that one. That's an easy one. It means position. So the Greek word means taking the position of a son. We take the same position. We take position into the family of God as a son. The Bible tells us that God's son took our place or took our position on Calvary's cross. Amen. And then through that, through that sacrifice, we are now able to take position in God's family as sons and daughters. With all the rights, with all the privileges as a son or a daughter of God. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9 Paul says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that he might, so that by his poverty we might become rich. You see, being adopted means that we enter into God's family. But adoption isn't how that takes place. Yes, we are adopted, but listen, John told Nicodemus what? You must be what? Born again. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Have you been born again this morning? See, that's the question we must ask ourselves. Have you experienced God's love? You see, adoption speaks of our standing within God's family. The moment you're born again, you're placed into God's family. As adopted sons, heirs to the kingdom, heirs to the, to the riches of the glory of God. Like I said earlier, we think normally as adoption of being that which is adopting a small child. That's what we see in our culture. But in Greek culture, it, it, they adopted full grown adults. You know, it would be like Henry Ford not having an heir, finding a, a Harvard grad with an understanding of business and he's proven himself and he looks and says, this is a worthy young man to carry on my name, to be heir to the Ford dynasty. And he asked the young man, would you like to be my adopted son? Now, listen, being heir to the Ford uh, fortune you get your winter house in Hawaii, your summer house in Tahiti. You get a jet to take you everywhere you want and $3 million in salary a year. How many would say, yes, please pick me? Anybody looking for that rich uncle? 
Listen, we gain much more through our adoption as sons and daughters of God. Not only are our sins forgiven, but we inherit all of the riches and the glory. All the riches and the glory of heaven. It is in and through the blood of Christ. You see, the moment you're born again, you assume the position of the adopted son. Heir to the riches of the father. You know, too often people say, oh, listen, I, 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 I'm too young in the faith. I, 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 I've just been a Christian a little while. I can't serve. I can't do. I can't be. Listen, that is not what adoption teaches us. Because again, adoption teaches that you're adopted as a fully mature son or daughter of God. What do you mean? Listen, your understanding may change, but the power of the Spirit working inside of you, because as we learned last week, it was given to us as the first promise, is the same Spirit that works inside of someone who's been a Christian for 85, 90 years. I'd pick on Bill, but he hasn't not quite that old. That same Spirit works inside of us. You know, there's too often people will also say, listen, I can't do it because, you know, I'm just, I don't know enough. That's the wrong answer because the Holy Spirit lives with inside you. When we're adopted into the kingdom of God, we have all the privileges and all the responsibilities. All the responsibilities of the kingdom. You're adopted as mature sons and daughters. You not only enjoy the blessings, but too often we forget that we also enjoy the responsibilities. Now listen, even though we're adopted into the kingdom of God as sons and daughters, that doesn't mean that we are equal to Jesus. Amen? Okay? The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, only begotten son. And right now in the church, and I put this in the big worldwide global thing, we see it a lot in Africa, in, in uh, Brazil, Shane and Aaron deal with it, the word of faith movement that's going on. That word of faith movement, and they, they say things like, you know, Jesus is the son of God and you're a son of a God. Jesus created all things through his word. Therefore, you can create all things through your word. You know, speak the word of faith, brother. Just speak the word of faith. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Uh Uh-uh. Okay. Listen, do our words have power? Absolutely. The Bible tells us they have life or death is in in the power of our word. I'm not suggesting that words don't have power, but what I'm saying is, is that although that, that we are sons and daughters, that Christ still reigns supreme. He is still supreme. The word of, te- the word of faith teaching errs in saying that because God said it, said, let there be light, you can say, let there be light. Listen, who said that let there be light and there was light? Who said it? God. The last time I looked around, and I know some of you pretty well, uh, nope, okay, you can't even get the little G, okay? Much less the big G. We have to remember that he is God. You know, some would say, well, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Or they'll quote in Matthew, from Matthew uh, 21, 22, Jesus answered and said, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you tell this mountain be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. And if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. That means I can ask God for anything? Anything I want? Okay, now let's put it a little context, okay? When Jesus says we can ask for anything, we must remember that our asking must be in his name. Now I have a charge account down at Rocky Mountain Supply, okay? Lorna knows that because I'm in there and I use it all the time, okay? And on that charge account are my family members, okay? Okay? 
that can charge on my family account. Kind of sounds like what Jesus is talking about. If we're part of the family of God, we can charge on his account, right? Now listen, if you go down and you say, hey, listen, I'm part of Curtis's family and I need some horseshoes, okay? Lorna might scratch her head. She works down there. Might scratch her head, but she'd go, hey, that's something that Curtis would charge on his charge account all the time. And she would probably let you sign for him. But now if you went down there and said, hey, I want to charge a whole bunch of women's clothing. I have never charged any women's clothing on my account my entire time. I, I'm serious. Dwayne, never. Okay? Never. She would go, oh, hey, no, nope, uh-uh, that ain't right. It's the same thing when we try to charge things to Jesus' charge account. Jesus never asked for anything outside of God's will. He never asked for anything selfishly. Anything that we ask for that's within the parameters of God's will, we will see that prayer answered. Okay, I'm going to use one that we can all relate to. How many of us have ever prayed for a loved one not to die, only to have them pass away? See, Jesus taught us in the, when he, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then at the end, he says, your will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. See, we have to under, look at that. How that applies Listen, if we sincerely are desiring the things that God desires and it is his will, his time, we will see those prayers answered. Because we are the children of God. Being God's children, listen, separates us from the world. The world doesn't desire God and doesn't know God. It even refused to recognize him when he came. He says he... In John 10, uh, in the Gospel of John, 1.10 says, He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. As believers, we can hardly expect the world to understand us or to recognize the special relationship that we have with God. And guys, right now, in the time of our nation's history, and today's the day that we celebrate our independence, Okay, the church, those who call upon Jesus are under attack. Our government for the first time is looking how to restrict, to restrict us as Christians. Never before in our history. Listen to the words of Jesus. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of it, and the world hates you. John wrote in verse 2 of chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 2, Dear friends, we are God's children, and now what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him as he is. See some glorious time in the future. We will be like him. But right now we are his kids. At this present time. If we've called upon the name of Jesus. As children of God we have a glorious future. And Paul gives us, or John gives us a glimpse of what that future is. It is that we would be like Christ. When we behold him face to face. You know, I've always struggled with people who say, you know, I want to, I, I, I'm a Christian. Oh, I love Jesus, but I don't like spending time with him privately. I don't like spending time with him corporately. Why would I want to spend eternity with him then? 
because I'm going to be just like him. You're going to be just like him. If the desire of your heart isn't to be like him today, do you really know the same Jesus that I know? Because one day we will behold him face to face. You say all the pain and the struggle. Paul said this. But everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be lost because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Let me read that again. I also consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but that one is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or am ready or, or, or am already perf perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have because I have also been taken hold of by Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forget what is behind and reach forward to what is ahead. I press on as my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Oh, what great love the Father given us. He's given us Christ. He's adopted us into his family, his sons and daughters. Are you pursuing him? Or is it all the other things? One day I'll get to that. Listen, guys, if we don't want to be with him here and now, if we don't want to be like him here and now, why would we ever want to be like him for eternity? See, that's a deep question. I can tell you why I want to be like him. Because while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. loved me enough to give up everything to have me. He proved it over and over again. Oh, what great love he has bestowed upon me. And I just want to be like my Jesus. Do you I'm like Paul, I haven't made it yet. I've got so many failures in my past. But I can't live in the rearview mirror. I have to press on towards the goal. That one day I would behold him face to face. And be like him.